So, uh, yeah, Richard, perhaps you could uh, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about Richard and his career. Do you want me to do the full thing or? Yeah, well, go for it. Go for it. So, hi, everyone. Uh, Richard Newsom, so have recently entered the world of, um, I think I'm just about used to saying retirement now. That was a bit of, a, that was a bit of an obstacle for me. Um, but have been in and around the technology game in a, in a whole variety of different settings for probably about 40 years now. So it's definitely time to give up and move on. Um, my, my brief today was to really just tell you a little bit about that story. Um, not that it's terribly thrilling at all, but it might just sort of prompt some discussion and questions. Um, and so I'm going to rattle through that pretty quickly. There are plenty of people in the audience who've been part of this journey at some stage. Um, my memory is deliberately selective. Um, so if there's anything here that you disagree with, uh, if you want to throw rotten fruit or any of that sort of thing, then that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I'm going to start. Um, that was originally going to build, but there oh. we are, the great unveil. Um, I'm going to start where my career started, which was at Boots. Um, and I'm going to immediately demonstrate how old I am by saying that I started in a world of COBOL coding sheets. Come on, hands up anyone who remembers COBOL coding sheets. You're not. Uh, booking time on terminals to be able to enter your code and compile your code and run tests and so on. Uh, so join Boots on their grad scheme at a time when they were investing very significantly in building a tech capability. Tech was very much, I think for a lot of organisations, in its infancy at that time. Um, and when I joined, I, um, I was lucky enough to work for the guy who had been the first... IT employee in Boots in the early 60s. Um, I mean, by this time, he was sort of well into his career and managing teams of hundreds of people. Um, but he told me that when he was first taken on by Boots, which was, I think, in about 1962 or 1963, he was taken on on a six-month contract because no one was quite sure what he was going to do when he had written the programme. <laughs> sort of fast forward 15, 16 years, and as I say, he was, no, more years than that, actually, 20 years, and he was, he was managing multi-million pounds of budgets and, and, and very complex technology and growing teams of people. So uh, jo join Boots into that environment along with many other, many other grad trainees as part of that scheme. Went through what I think at the time was a pretty traditional early stage career, so move from programming into analyst programming, then into leading teams, and then into, into managing projects. Um, I was a pretty good coder, actually, but soon, in fact, where's Guy? Guy, I've got a job for you. So Guy is still at Boots. Sorry, Guy, Guy is now at Boots. He wasn't at Boots all those years ago. Um, I was told three or four years ago that some of my code is still running. <laughs> now, I take that as being a really good thing and a sign of high quality in the coding. <laughs> Other people may take a different view. PS500 and PS510. I'll look out for Look out for me, thank you. Um, so started, started to move away from a technical background. And I guess one of the themes as I look at my 40 years is bringing business and technology together. Because very early on, it became obvious to me that my buzz wasn't in producing great code, even though it was, but was in bringing technology capability and business capability together to deliver change, which was improving the lot of customers, employees, suppliers, supply chains, and so on and so on. Um, and, and, and really then sort of continued with, continued with those themes through a number of different sort of iterations of those roles, increasing, um, increasing in size and complexity and so on within Boots. I had a spell in Boots, um, and, and they were very good at the time at moving people into and out of various different functions of the, of the organisation. So I, didn't, I don't think I ever fully left technology behind. 
but I had spells running parts of the supply chain, uh, running some big change programs in, in sort of commercial parts of the organization and so on. Um, but when push came to shove, I always ended up moving back into technology. I left there almost 20 years later, so about half my career was at Boots. Um, having brought together all of the various different technology functions at Boots into a single, I think at the time what was called a shared service, but was essentially a single technology capability. Um, so that was a very significant piece of organizational change, operating model change, and, and so on and so on. And again, that was starting to sort of build an experience that I then sort of called on in, in other places. Um, moved on from Boots and moved to work for an organization called Zansa, which doesn't exist anymore. I think it was bought by Steria, the French IT and business process outsourcing organization. Um, that single group of technologists that um, my final piece of work at Boots brought together was then effectively in scope for a very, very significant outsource. So of what at the time was about 700 technologists in Boots, um, big outsource to a combination of Zansa for applications, IBM for services and infrastructure. So about a third, two thirds, probably about 20 people stayed in Boots at the end of that. So that was very much in vogue at the time. There were lots of those similar sorts of deals. I left to join Zansa, spent most of my time there managing their business with Tesco. And that was a really good grounding, you know, real sort of steep learning curve in commercial understanding, managing technology and technology teams for profit. Um, as you can imagine, Tesco were a real breeze to work with, weren't demanding in any way at all. So that was always a bit of a joy. Um, but what I found was that that was taking me away from that point at which business and technology comes together. So as a supplier to Tesco, even, even though we did just great work for them, you were only ever really sort of receiving the output of those conversations rather than being in the mix, helping to build strategy, build plans, and, and, and really drive priorities of um, where, where investment and change was going to take place. So I then moved back into, uh, I guess, what a service organisation would call the client-side role, and was very lucky to be appointed UK and Ireland IT director at Cadbury. Um, absolutely loved my time at Cadbury, was there uh, sort of three or four years. Again, did a lot of work bringing the technology teams and the business teams together. That, that work had, was already well underway, so Cadbury had, um, had just come out of a very long running ERP implementation what was left behind as a result of that was a really capable technology team, but also a set of business leaders that really understood how to use technology to drive business performance. So I was very much building on sort of good ground there. We continued and, and expanded that into other parts of the organization. So for the first time, really started to invest in sales and marketing, as well as manufacturing and supply chain and so on. Um, was there when the Kraft organization took over Cadbury and, you know, to be really open, sort of left as a result of that. Not because, you know, I didn't, I, I actually ended up with a bigger job as a result of that, but actually the culture and the ways of working of the two organizations were very different. So almost overnight, I and my peers around the organization went from being, you know, really pretty autonomous leaders of functions within the largest part of the Cadbury group to being the local implementers of stuff that was decided and prioritized, you know, either in Zurich if it was European wide or global or in Chicago if it was global. That was just a very different way of working. And I guess I found out about myself, as many others did, that that autonomy was really important. So I moved from uh, Cadbury to Rolls-Royce in Derby, quite a lot of ex-colleagues from Rolls-Royce in the room. Um, joined IT at Rolls-Royce at what I think was a pretty dynamic, is that a right word? <laughs> Time of great change, um, slightly chaotic, rather oddly, given the brand of the organisation and, you know, focus on quality and so on. 
Um, but again, learn, learn loads at Rolls-Royce. I mean, work with some sort of fabulous people. They're obviously part of a fabulous organization, um, you know, very central to the economy of, of, of this area and so on. I'm sure, I'm sure there are lots of um, uh, rip, old Riptonians, is that the right term? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Who are still at Rolls-Royce and maybe lots of students who are, um, uh, you know, who are the, who are the children of Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royces. Um, again, strove very hard there to bring technology and business together and formulate programs of change which were genuinely not just doing the right thing in terms of technology but doing the right things in terms of moving the, the organisation forward. Uh, I, again, I'll be really honest, I think I have mixed success in doing that. I think doing that in an organisation whose default is really quite siloed is, is pretty tough. I always think that one of the real privileges of IT leadership roles is, you know, you can only do your job by looking across the organisation as well as down into your technology silo. I always think I'm a bit of a joiner of the dots. But looking across and joining the dots of an organisation that doesn't want to be joined up sometimes is, is quite hard. So um, I don't know whether that resonates with, with uh, colleagues who were at Rolls-Royce at the time or maybe others in the audience from your organisations. But yeah, there's both a privilege and a bit of pain there, I guess. I then uh, moved to, uh, to uh, role at Sainsbury's as number two to the C CIO who'd just been appointed. He was very much from a digital e-commerce background, and I think they felt that they needed also somebody to work alongside him who'd, who'd been in and around the sort of corporate IT game for quite a while. Somebody older, not wiser necessarily, but I guess had seen and had some of the, some of the operational scars and, and seen sort of big complex uh, enterprise-wide change programs. Um, so Sainsbury's absolute joy to work at, absolutely loved my time there. A couple of years after I'd been there, uh, the guy that I was number two to left. He left at the time that the organisation was in a bit of a state of flux. So I put my hand up for and was asked to fill in as interim group CIO for what, what turned out to be 12 months. I was very clear with the organisation that that for me wasn't going to be a keeping the seat warm sort of role, but you know I had some really um, clear plans for the role and there were loads of things that we'd done brilliantly over the previous two years, but loads still to do. Um, and really the rest of my time at Sainsbury's in a variety of leadership roles was, I guess, I guess probably the pivot point was turning the organisation from one that was very traditionally organised and traditionally traditional in terms of skill set and structure and operating model, so very project and program centric, to one that was much more product centric, much more focused on outcomes again, combination of sort of technology and business outcomes, mostly led by business outcomes. And if you can do great stuff with the tech as well, fantastic. Um, and one in which were, ways of working were very much based around agile principles. Actually, that was a bit of a pivot point, not just for, not just for me and, and, and my leadership team, but for the rest of the technology organisation. And again, was a real enabler of bringing technology and business teams together. Um, such that I think if anyone had looked at those teams, you know, in the days that we did work side by side, would have had real difficulty working out who were the product people, who were the engineering people, who was the architect, who was the business lead and so on. Uh, and that for me is a really, really positive sign. Um, and then finally, having moved on from, decided to move on from Sainsbury's, looked for a role with probably more of a sense of purpose um, and was really thrilled to be offered the role as CTO at Cancer Research UK. Um, I think if you're looking for a role with a purpose, charities generally, but you know, cancer research I found particularly you know, the, everybody is there for the same reason. Everybody understands that reason. Everybody, you know, and this is, I guess, um, an asset for the organisation, but clearly um, massively unfortunate. You know, everybody is touched by cancer in some way, shape or form, whether it's directly or indirectly. 
So the purpose of the organisation resonates not just with everyone who works there, but everyone who, who touches the organisation in whatever way. Um, that is a real source of uh, strength. It binds people together within the organisation. Uh, and, you know, just come out of spending a couple of years there, again, turning that organisation from one that's very project-centric, one where the tech team, there'd been a bit of a gulf between the tech team and the rest of the organisation, to an organisation where those two things are utterly embedded and where everybody talks about outcomes, products, and much more agile ways of working rather than, um, rather than sort of traditional programme structures. Yeah, 40 years in a nutshell. The, the two at the bottom, so along the way I picked up a couple of non-exec roles. The first one was at Nottingham University, so again, one or two of the university tech team here. I was the first um, digital guy on the, on the board of governors. Of course, a lot of my colleagues would have a wry grin at me being the digital guy. Um, and... Uh, for me, closed a bit of a loop, so I'd studied at Nottingham originally, uh, always remained as a, as a resident of Nottingham, so again, had a huge sort of resonance with, with a lot of my history and values and so on and so on. Um, so I can talk to anybody who's interested about what it's like to be a non-exec, particularly in the, in the sort of higher education sector. And... The one bit of work that I have left is I'm uh, one of three non-exec directors at a, an organisation called Demon, Demon Solutions, who are a software, cloud and data engineering consultancy, do a lot of work in retail organisations, a lot of work in governments, a lot of work in, in public sector more generally, uh, and are really on a mission to, you know, to make a difference, genuinely on a mission to, to make a difference to their uh, to, to the organisations that they work with. So do quite a lot of coaching, helping the two founders step away from the organisation. We'll talk about that if you like. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just me doing a little bit of dabbling and, and just having the last vestige of um, responsibility before I retire for good. Um, yeah, 40 years in a nutshell. Coding sheets to chat GPT, chat GPT I think. Is, if, I were, if, I, if I were to ever write a book, that would probably be something like the title. Um, that's probably taken me a lot longer than I expected. But 40 <laughs> years is a long, long time. <laughs> Hopefully, there, I know there are one or two people in the audience who were nodding because, yes, that is how it was like at that place at that time. Uh, but hopefully it's given you a bit of a sense of I don't know, is that a typical leadership journey over 40 years? It's probably not atypical of people who've been around organisations of that size and scale. Hopefully it's given you a little bit of a sense of what's driven me and it's very much about, about the ultimate outcome. It's not the tech itself, it's, it's making a strong positive difference and giving you a little bit of a sense of you know, just one or two of the sort of leadership challenges and opportunities along the way. But mostly it's meant to whet your appetite and enable you to come up with lots of questions that I'm going to do a very bad job at answering, I think. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Richard. That's, that's fantastic. We, we did canvas uh, people who were due to come today for, for what questions they might have. And uh, <coughs> let's have a look. If you could have Thank you for these, by the way. Yeah. If you could have any superpower... Superhero power, what would it be and why? That was, that was the most popular. I mean, apart from the ones that? I already have. Yeah, yeah. And the additional ones. Uh, I would love to go back in time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone who reaches their early 60s would give up that as a superpower, to be honest. But I, but I think also professionally, I mean, you know, some of the lessons that you learn along the way are quite, are quite hard lessons, aren't they? I mean, you know, there will be very few people in this room who've tried to make a difference and not, not found obstacles at some point. But, you know, equally, there are very few of us in the room who haven't had outrageous successes far beyond anything that you would have imagined. Um, but to be able to take the lessons from that back into the early stages of your career, I think, yeah. you know, professionally, that would be, that would be my superpower. Anyone with me on that? Oh, we do have some serious questions, but... 
It would be what, sorry? Lottery win, Michael. Lottery win. Yeah, 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 OK. I'll give you that one. I mean, obviously, I have some questions, but I think, yeah, ultimately, let's, let's hear from people in the audience who want to. Louise. Can we hear a piece from the um, launch of the first charge card? The advantage card? Yeah. Yes. Because that was the first in the market and really difficult. To yeah, I, I'm never quite. So I, I think I had quite a lot of firsts at Boots, and I'm never quite sure whether that one was the first or whether Club Card at Tesco quite just about. Just about won that won that battle. Marginal. Was it marginal? Oh, that was both of them, maybe. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. Advantage card, and you know, to to a world of data and AI and so on. Um, I mean, advantage card was you know was a bit of a was a bit of a sea change. I think. I remember. You're going to get me going on. Oh, I remember the day when, but. <laughs> um, I do remember somebody coming back from analyzing the first set of advantage card data and so coming up with this great plan of completely reshaping the layout of the store. Because what you suddenly find is all of the adjacencies that you thought were right, because if people go in and buy product X, of course they're going to buy product Y. Actually, there's no data to support that at all. And the big one that people always referred to was, I don't know whether people remember the, um, the boot store in Victoria Centre, used to have baby product on the ground floor, and I think had at least three floors open at the time, if not four, and prams were on the top floor. <laughs> and there were lots of good reasons for that. Um, but very quickly they started to move baby products together. Um, Maybe an obvious one, but one that really, you know, the, 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 the data started to pull out in, in a much more powerful way. Um, equally, when, uh, so probably the program that I cut my teeth on first at Boots was the first implementation of electronic point of sale. And on the first day of the first trial store, the managing director appeared and asked at ask, uh, lunchtime and asked for the daily sales report because, of course, the idea was you could have almost sort of real-time data. We gave him the top ten, and he threw a complete fit, r scrunched the paper up, threw it to one side, asked us what the effing hell we've been doing, wasting his money and all this time over the last two or three years because everyone knew that razor blades were the top-selling item at that store. Of course, the sales report didn't tell him that. The sales report said nothing of the kind. In fact, they weren't even in the top 10. <laughs> the reason being that the previous way of calculating sales was how many have we got in the store at the beginning of the day? How many have we got at the end of the day? The difference is the sales. <laughs> All of the razor blades were leaving via other means. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. You don't need a whacking great data lake to have some real good insights. <laughs> So you're going to get me reminiscing there. Go ahead. Um, I was a really interesting story. Thank you for sharing your career. So I work in information security, and you've got some really high-risk organisations like Rolls-Royce and kind of nation states and things to do with web. I'd be interested to know how much of your career focused on cybersecurity, and in hindsight, would you have spent more or less on it? Um. So I guess my first direct experience, you know, and, and, and the role of the CISO and the role of the IT security team has changed enormously over the years, hasn't it? So I guess when I turned up at Sainsbury's, it was, it was pretty sort of embedded, like you had to really squint to find it. It was pretty embedded in the guts of the service operations team. But it was very clear that we need to elevate it out and build the capability and have the team, frankly, talking a language that the rest of the organisation would, under, would understand. Um, I, I, I think to come to your, in retrospect, did we invest the right amount or the wrong amount? Certainly my experience at Sainsbury's and Cancer Research is in neither organisation, this isn't a very good answer by the way, in neither organisation did we suffer major breaches. If you work on the basis of the ends justifying the means, I, 
we've probably got the investment about right. However, having said that, back to the question, you know, what keeps you awake at night? I, I can't imagine there is a CTO or a CIO and certainly not a CISO around uh, in, in this room or around the country who wouldn't have cyber on the top. Because every time somebody does suffer a breach, there's a little bit of there, but for the grace of God, to be honest. And particularly with an organisation like Sainsbury's where, you know, you've probably got information about almost every household in the country. You know, you're serving 25 million customer transactions a week. Um, probably more now that um, Argos is much more integrated into, into the rest of the organisation. And that information is incredibly valuable. You've got nectar points, which you can monetize very, very easily. Um, so we would occasionally find things on the dark web. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's ever possible for any CIO to win an argument that says that we should be investing less. I, I think the balance is how much of your budget should you be investing? And rough rule of thumb, I, I would say about 10% of your investment budget could go into, <coughs> in, into your security platforms. Mark, I think Mark was next, sorry. Sorry, just a, a question really about where you started. And you mentioned COBOL programming. And I think, for me, it's, it's still around today, COBOL programming. Yeah. There's a lot, lot of demand for COBOL programming. I think maybe you could answer a question in terms of saying, why is it still around? And two, why can't you get people interested in programming in it? <laughs> why is it still around? You, you mean why are, why are organisations still carrying a 40-year legacy? Um, I, I think the answer to that varies from each organisation to the, to the next, to be honest. Um, you know, there's clearly been a lot of investment over the last 10 or 20 years in building engineering capability, migrating away from data centres into the public cloud and so on and so on. Certainly my experience is most organisations still get left with a core of stuff that runs effectively, runs efficiently, um, the cost of change is high, the risk of change is high, and the risk of migrating fully away from you know, that, that old platform is, is equally high. And in competition with pretty well every other demand from around the organization to make investment you know, across the entirety of the business and across the entirety of the estate, I actually don't think it's unreasonable for organizations still to maintain that legacy. Um, the cost of change to that is very high. So at the point at which you do decide that you want to you know, process sales information or run your account or whatever differently, I think that's when the case for change becomes, becomes greater. But um, it doesn't surprise me, and I don't think it's a bad thing that organizations still have 40-year-old systems on their estate. Yeah, that's me, me just being a very pragmatic ex-CTO, really. Um, if, if there is still a demand for skills out there, that, that, that's great. That does give me personally the option of retraining. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must tell you, my <laughs> you are going to get me reminiscing. My first performance review was a letter that I received from my boss. So, you know, this idea of having a long discussion around a number of different objectives and so there was a letter I got from my boss that had one sentence on it and it said, Richard, Richard writes very elegant, effective code. <laughs> and that was my performance review. <laughs> so maybe I should resurrect that skill set. <laughs> no, I, no, I think it's got, it got binned along the way. <laughs> Richard, thanks. It's a uh, very storied career and um, appreciate you sharing that. If there's a book, I'll definitely buy it. <laughs> um, interested over your 40 year career, um, your perspectives on diversity and inclusion, particularly as a head of IT? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Um, 
So this has become a really big thing for me personally, in part because the debate around diversity and inclusion, and particularly the concepts of inclusion, are so resonant with my personal values. And, you know, in retrospect, it's something that I should have been, could have been more vocal about or, I guess, more conscious of earlier in my career. Um, my last two organisations, uh, both Cancer Research and Sane Research, actually started in very... What I found when I joined the organisations was, was very, very different. So when I joined Sainsbury's, I would say really quite an undiverse technology team. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of recollecting and estimating numbers, but I would say in terms of, you know, maybe gender diversity, 80% male, 20% female. But the female population very, very much focused around certain role types. Yeah, so it felt a lot less diverse than than, than that may feel. Cancer research. When I, so cancer research is a very female-oriented organisation. So I think across the workforce as a whole, across the whole of cancer research, it's probably about twenty-five percent male, seventy-five percent female. In tech, it was about forty-five, fifty-five. So majority in. Uh, majority uh, female and the majority of my leadership team that I created there was was female so seeing very different sort of dynamics um, if, if we talk about gender diversity I became a very strong proponent of quotas um, and I'm, I'm very conscious that that is you know a very thorny subject for all, all sorts of different people I became a champion of quotas for example because I wanted to make a difference very quickly and if your view of um, if you take a view of history repeating itself I personally didn't have time and I didn't have the energy to wait for years and years and years for that change to be made I you know I get that there's a whole stem education sixth form education, so on and so on, dimension to that. But I wanted to make a difference more, more quickly than that. Um, so I tried to become a very strong um, uh, champion for, uh, for those people who didn't feel included in my organisations. Um, when I worked at Cancer Research, I was the exec sponsor for the Health and Disability Network. When I worked at Sainsbury's, I became quite a strong voice around events like Black History Month and, and Pride Month and so on and so on. Brought a lot of people from diverse backgrounds into the organisation. Um, but yeah, the work is never done, I think would be, would be my view. And you know, I would, I would really, really encourage, yeah, it is genuinely, there's not just the whole load of personal experience, but there is now, oodles of academic research that shows that diverse teams are higher performing, um, more creative, deliver better, are more fulfilling for colleagues than undiverse teams. And I would, I would always support that. That's a great perspective, thank you. J just conscious of time, because uh, we don't want to get too far behind, but perhaps what, what, what room for one more question? Not quite see. Go ahead. Guy, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, two questions. One, what was it like working for a charity? Because I think probably most people work for commercial organisations yeah. and how that was doing with them very quickly as second world apparently and just had a message that the codes got down. It's like we would fix it is what's being asked. Wouldn't you be surprised if I could? <laughs> um, uh, What's it like working for a charity? Yeah, so for me, it was, a, as I said before, it was a very deliberate decision. To, so I'd always, I'd always really found, tried to find, I'm not a very good capitalist, actually. I'd, I'd always tried to find a deep, deeper purpose in the organisations that I worked for. And, yeah, that was much easier in some organisations than others. You know, you really had to sort of peer hard in one or two places. Um, and ultimately, that sort of sapped my engagement, I think. 
So as I was leaving Sainsbury's, it was very, I, I was very clear with myself that I wanted to try and find an organisation with a deep purpose. Um, but, but, but actually, you know, wasn't particularly focused on the charity sector. Um, you know, was probably more focused on not-for-profit generally or, or public sector or government. Um, how did I find working for a charity? Um, I, I think the big upside is, and p particularly powerful in cancer research, everybody is there for the purpose. And, and you know, it really is amazing how that can bind people together. And when you're having difficult conversations and when you're, you know, you're not quite making the progress, that you, you know, just to remind everyone that we're here to beat cancer. I mean, that's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if people aren't galvanised and motivated by that, then that's interesting. Um, what I did find about working for a charity is um, some of the cliches hold true. So a little bit less fast moving and bear in mind you know I joined from an organization that you know probably was moving at the speed of light as in so, you know particularly during the COVID time so to join from a sector and an organization that moves as fast as Sainsbury's and retail you know that was that was quite a big that was quite a sort of jarring move in some ways um, the reason that in my experience that the charity moved a little bit less quickly is really, really strong drive for consensus. So really strong drive for engagement in decision making and consensus behind the decision that's made, such that when that decision is made, you've got the full force of the organisation behind it. So ultimately, you might get to the same point in, in broadly the same period of time. It just seems like it seems pretty treacly up front. So I would say that was sort of culturally quite a quite a big difference. Um, the thing that I found really, really encouraging actually was lots of people with incredibly strong opinions. So, you know, this idea that, that you know, charities could be a bit nicey-nicey, they, they are, and the purpose brings people together, but boy, have people got some strong opinions as well. And I don't know whether I don't know whether this is one of the Amazon principles, but this idea of like strong opinions lightly held, I probably uttered that uh, uttered that statement five times a day for the whole of the period that I was there, because sometimes people would hold on to those opinions so strongly. I said to someone, "You're holding that opinion so strongly that all anyone can see is your fist," <laughs> and you know that 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 sometimes took some took some breaking down. So upside, fantastic that people have strong opinions, but if that gets in the way of bringing people together and collaborating to, to drive for the outcome, that can be a bit of a, bit of a challenge. But yeah, I mean, if anyone's thinking of, there's a, I mean, a lot of my old peers as CTOs in some of the bigger charities had made a very similar to move to me and gone from the commercial sector into the charity sector. So there are loads of people who've made that, you know, if that's something that anyone's ever thinking of at some stage in their career, then happily talk to you. But yeah, you wouldn't be alone in making that move, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. So that's a round of applause. For